Hello there. Would you like some inside information and tricks on how to uh, come up with ideas for comics? Then you need to check out this video. Well, everyone, it's me, your old pal, Max West. As you know, I draw comics. I also do children's picture books. And today, I, I thought I'd talk to you a bit about um, ideas. You know, ideas for comic strips, ideas for comic books, ideas for graphic novels, for manga, for, for that neat webcomic you've, you've got in your head. But, you know, all that's for nothing unless you have an idea. Now, where do you get ideas? That's not an easy question for me to answer. I mean, it's not like, you know, you just go to the store and buy a book that says 1,000 ideas for comics. I mean, that just, just doesn't work that way. All right, getting back to the original question... I actually asked this once to uh, Howard Scott Warshaw. He's the man who programmed a number of Atari games like Yars Revenge and the infamous game E.T. He said that ideas are a dime a dozen. You don't really get them. You find them. All right, I mean, that's good and all, but you're probably wondering, where do I find ideas for comics? They're, again, they're everywhere. You just need to know where to look. Here's one of my tips on how to, how to get some, find some ideas for comics. Your personal experiences. Draw upon what's happened in your own life. I mean, do you remember your first day of school? You remember what it was like for you in high school? Do you remember when you took a fun vacation, or maybe when you took a bad vacation? Well, there you've got some ideas for comics. You know, draw upon the places you've been, the places you want to go. An example of this, Sunnyville Stories, the independent comic series that I draw, that was largely based on some of my own experiences was uh, back during the first half of the 1990s. I, your humble creator, I moved from the big city of New York to rural North Carolina. Hmm. And that was quite an experience. I went from a big city with lots of amenities everywhere to a small town out in the middle of nowhere where you needed a car to get around. And they had nowhere near the same level of amenities we had back in New York. Yeah, that's reflected in the work itself. Rusty moving to the tiny town of Sunnyville from, from a big city. And draw upon your experiences. Here's another way you can find ideas. Look at other sources. You know, you can, you can read books. You can browse through some magazines. You know, try surfing on the web. Try watching some televisions and movie movies. I have all kinds of sources myself. I, for example, I have a lot of uh, DVDs of cartoons and, and movies. I like to watch some examples here. I like to get inspiration from uh, Garfield and Friends or ALF. I also watch The Three Stooges, The Marx Brothers, Laurel and Hardy. Mystery Science Theater 3000. I'll watch classic cartoons like, like Looney Tunes, Tom and Jerry, Disney. I have a fair collection of, uh, of newspaper comic reprint books. I like to thumb through them, sort of like Dennis the Menace. <laughs> There's a receipt there. Tumbleweeds, which was a very big inspiration for Poison Ivy Gulch. Broom Hilda, this is a good one. Heathcliff, like Dennis the Menace, it's mainly gag panels. And really, The Wizard of Id. I mean, this is really good. <laughs> yeah, this was a very powerful influence on, on my work, Poison Ivy Gulch. 
And that ties into the next thing I want to talk about. Borrow an idea. I mean, there's nothing wrong with just, you know, borrowing from here and there. You should, you should of course, just not do outright plagiarism. I mean, look at, look at George Lucas's Star Wars. That's basically Buck Rogers and, and Flash Gordon mixed in with some Akira Kurosawa films. I mean, Poison Ivy Gulch was largely based on blazing saddles as well as tumbleweeds. All right, you found your ideas. Now what do you do with them? Well, it's probably a good idea to record those ideas. There are all kinds of tools you can do, you can use for those. All right, good old-fashioned pen and paper. Yeah, I know in this digital age, a lot of you like to use your smartphones or your tablets or your high-tech PCs and Macs. I'm more of an old-fashioned guy, so usually using a pen. I'll jot down ideas in notebooks. Yeah, see here? These are various jokes. I scour through books. I watch movies and television, I browse the web, I have some, uh, I have access to databases full of old magazines and newspapers like Boy's Life, Reader's Digest, and I like to frequently search for ideas. You know, if I find a good joke, I record it here, and really, in these notebooks, you can record so much. I mean, in this book alone, I have well over a O over a thousand jokes that I can go through, so I have plenty of material. Yeah, this is a second second notebook of mine. <laughs> yeah, it's about roughly halfway full, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, already, look. I mean, look at all this stuff I've got. Sketchbooks are another good source of capturing your ideas. You can carry a small one with you, or you can carry a big one like this. Oh, I jot, like to scribble down ideas here. Yeah, you might remember these from the 30-day drawing challenge. This is a uh, bank robber I wanted to use in a future story, Rufus Cotton. Some sketches of the Poison Ivy Gulch characters. You know, draw what you see. Sketch people on the subway or the bus. Sketch birds in the park. Maybe do a quick sketch of that goofy-looking billboard you see on the side of the road. I mean, they're just full of i. The, the world is full of ideas. They're all out there for the taking, and all you have to do is find them. Then, you gotta capture them. Notebooks, sketchbooks. You can also take pictures, you know, grab a digital camera or your or your smartphone if you've got one. Yeah, if you got one of these, just snap photos. Audio recorders are handy. You can invest in a digital audio recorder, or if you have an app on your smartphone, you know, if you hear a funny phrase or you see a funny joke, you know, record it. I do that myself sometimes. Yeah, see? All this. I, I started this notebook back in 2017. Yeah, this is the, these books are ye the year's worth of research into uh, all kinds of ideas that I found. So I've got plenty of material to last me for a long time. Well, that about does it for this video. Next time, I'm going to talk uh, more about how to make comic strips. You know, in the meantime, just um, make sure you hit the subscribe button, subscribe to my YouTube channel, hit the bell icon to be notified of uh, new videos, and check the links below if you want to see my work, like Poison Ivy Gulch. And after you, f after you finish watching this video, I want you to go out there and actually find some ideas. Read books. Go see a movie. Take a walk in the park. Look through some old magazines. Search through some advertisements. 
There's no telling what you may find. Well, until next time, friends, it's me, your old pal Max West, saying goodbye. Want some inside tricks on making thumbnails and layouts for your comics? Then you need to check this video out. <clears throat> Hello everyone. It's me, your old pal Max West. As you know, I draw comics and I do children's picture books. And today I want to talk about um, something very important with making comics, and that is with um, doing thumbnails, also called layouts. Now, what, what exactly is a thumbnail? Well, it's not, I'm not talking about one of these. What I'm talking about is basically preparation sketches for uh, before you actually draw the comic on the page. Okay, now, now, now maybe you're a bit confused there. I mean, you know, why do I need some thumbnail? I mean, can I just draw anything I want? Well, the purpose of comics is to tell some kind of story, like a short joke, or maybe an action and adventure story, or maybe some kind of drama. We humans, you see, we're creatures of order. When we look at something, like a book, or an advertisement, you know, or a movie, or a comic page, you know, we, we don't just look at it, we try to read it, we try to find some sense of order in there. And if, um, you know, if we can't see an obvious one, our brain will try to make order there. And, and if, if your comics just look like one big mess on, on the page without your readers knowing you know, where, where, where am I supposed to look next? What's going on? You know, you've lost your readers, and that's the kiss of death for any comic. Be it a webcomic, a graphic novel, manga. All right, I, I, I've talked about the importance of, of doing thumbnails. Now, how do you actually do them? Well, I'll get to that in just a moment. I'm going to talk a little bit about writing, too, because that does tie into um, doing the thumbnail. Now, once you've, uh, once you've got your idea down, as I talked about before in the last video, now you need to do some preparatory sketches. Do, do a thumbnail or two on the page. Now, the structure I usually follow, and many others do, is something called the three-act structure. This is a standard in screenplays for, for movies. Uh, people do this, too, in comics. It's a must-have for you know, comic strips like this, which I'll show you in just a moment. Of course, it can work for longer stories, too, be it your typical superhero comic, or your 300-page graphic novel, or that wacky manga that you got at the store. Now, I... Now, what exactly is the three-act structure? The three-act structure consists of three specific parts. The first part, we have the setup. The second part, the conflict. And the third part, resolution. I'll give you an example. This is a, this is a comic strip I did of Poison Ivy Gulch. Now here we have the characters. We have um, Rig R. Mortis. He's the local undertaker. And he's uh, visiting the newspaper office operated by this guy, Tab Stop, Poison Ivy Gulch's resident newspaper man. All right. Mr. Stop, your office has papers everywhere. Those are for my research. On what? Well, next week's paper is about littering. All right, there you have the three-act structure in place. This first panel, with Rigar Mortis just yelling at Tab Stop about all the, me the big mess in his office. This, essentially, is the setup. 
And now we have the conflict here in this panel. Tab stop is, is explaining, you know, this isn't a mess, that's for his research. And you and and Rigar Mortis wants to know what is this research for in this third panel resolution where the conflict is resolved. He explains the paper is about littering. And that's why we have the mess. He's doing research for littering. Now, try, try applying the three-act structure to comic strips out there. Peanuts, Calvin and Hobbes, Garfield, Wizard of Id, as well as some of the online web comics like Penny Arcade and Order of the Stick and PvP by Scott Kurtz. Uh, I'm going to give you a short demonstration now of myself doing a thumbnail. Now, when it comes to me, I usually don't do thumbnails with short works like comic strips or gag cartoons. I usually, you know, I usually tend to uh, work spontaneously. Still, though, I'm, I'm going to show you this here for our uh, illustrative purposes. Now I'm planning a comic strip for this uh, for this demo here, for this demonstration on how to make comics. It's going to involve cooking. Now when you're working with thumbnails, you know they they shouldn't be detailed. They should be very basic. You're just doing quick sketches to see if your idea or your writing works. When I do uh, thumbnails for Sunnyville Stories and Dominic and Claire, I tend to use stick figures. This is a story I'm going to be doing for Poison, for Poison Ivy Gulch. Here we have the setup. I have Ace here. Now this is a rough sketch. We're going to see his head here. And he's going to be looking downwards and speaking. Again, I, I stick to stick figures. Now, when you're doing a thumbnail, you know, don't obsess over it. I mean, I mean, don't draw something beautifully rendered. I mean, you know, what if you draw, what if you put a lot of work into making a thumbnail, it looks beautiful, but it doesn't actually work on the page? You know, then you've wasted a whole bunch of time. Remember, thumbnails are essentially preparatory sketches. Okay, that's the joke. But Ace, I thought you liked Chunky Soup. Essentially, the joke here is that Lotta serves Ace basically a big gelatinous block of what's supposed to be soup. It's, see, it's chunky soup, you know, like the canned soup brand. Lotta, what's this? But Ace, I thought you liked chunky soup. We have the setup. We have the conflict. We see the block of soup there. Lotta saying. And even though this is all one panel, the resolution is in there because here we have Ace giving a side glance, and a side glance to us, the readers. See, setup, conflict, resolution. Give you 
Now you see how that flows? This, of course, would work here. If I were to pencil this right now, I'd probably use it like that. Of course, some people, you know, they're not happy with doing just one. Even if the first one works, they may do multiple examples of thumbnails. They may try doing the standard three panel. They might do doing a four panel that follows the same structure, setup, conflict, resolution. Or may they may try all to fit it in one whole panel here. Here I trust my instincts. I feel this one is the best, so I'm going to go with this for the comic strip. And that, friends, is how you do comics thumbnails. You know, try practicing some of these on your own. Read some of the comic strips I mentioned, both newspaper comics and web comics. You know, see how they're set up. Try doing a few thumbnails of your own for some practice. Well, that's it for this uh, video today. Make sure you hit the subscribe button to subscribe to my channel. Also hit the uh, bell icon to be notified of new videos. If you want to check out more of my work, take a look at the links below. Until later, everybody, this is me, your old pal Max West, saying goodbye. Want to learn some inside tricks on uh, how to pencil comics? And you need to check this video out. Hello everyone, it's me, your old pal Max West. As you know, I draw comics and I also do children's picture books. And today, I'm going to talk more about how to make comics. Today's subject is penciling comic strips. Now before we continue, I just want to make it clear. In this series of tutorial videos on how to make comics, I'm going to be talking about more traditional tools. I'm old school. I'm going to be talking about pencils and pens and ink and that kind of stuff. If you want to draw comics digitally, like on the computer, you know, you're on your own there. There are lots of other video tutorials out there that will discuss what you need, such as, you know, the whole PC versus Mac debate. You know, software, drawing tools like tablets and such. That's all beyond the scope of this video. Anyway, getting back to what I was saying, I'm going to talk about penciling comics. Now, probably the very first thing you need, you'll need a good drawing surface, a good solid drawing surface, like this. Now, I use a flat drawing desk here. Yeah, it's seen a lot of action. You see all the ink and stuff on here, ink and paint and whatnot. Now, you don't have to... Now, probably if you go down to any art supply store or office supply store, you'll find, uh, you'll find drafting tables, either flat ones like these or the ones that tilt. But you don't have to spend a lot of money on anything fancy. I mean, just about anything will do. You could just go down your, to a your local Walmart or Target, buy a table, and that'll do. Now, what do you draw on? Well, a lot of my comics, like Sunnyville Stories and um, Dominic and Claire, I use Bristol paper. You can buy these at any art supply store. Usually it comes in two types. It comes in smooth, which is what I use, and there's also rough bristol board. If you do a lot of work with brushes, that's, that's a good one to use. Now, for doing my comic strips and such, I, um, I usually prefer this. These are comic strip art boards. They're about 5 and a half by 17 inches. You know, they'll take uh, pencils, pen, brush with ink. Now this is sold by a company called Blue Line Pro. This is what I usually draw Poison Ivy Gulch with. You might also be able to find these online or at art supply stores. This is Canson. 
Besides Bristol board, like the one I showed you a moment ago, they make these comic strip art boards that are similar, 5 inches by 17 inches. Of course, I don't tend to use these as much as the drawing area is much smaller than the Blue Line Pro. All right. Now, drawing with things. Pencils. Hence, that's why we call it penciling. Now, there are all kinds of pen... There are two basic kinds of pencils that you can use. There's the standard wood encased pencils like this. This is a 2H. This is an H pencil. If you see pencils that are H, like H, 2H, 3H, 4H, these are light pencils. The standard number two pencil, which is also the workhorse I use, is an HB pencil. And then there's the B line of pencils. B, 2B, 3B, 4B, 5B, and so on. Those are very soft. Of course, most of what I draw with, this is a mechanical pencil. Basically, you, um, oh, instead of sharpening, when you use a wooden pencil like this, you use a pencil sharpener. <laughs> I need to empty that out. Now, when these mechanical pencils ru run out of lead, just click on them to extend the lead. And when they run out, you put more lead in. Again, these are sold at office supply stores and art supply stores. Of course, no one is perfect, so you're probably going to make mistakes, and you're also going to need these for the inking stage, which I'll talk about in a future video. You should get erasers. This is a small pencil size eraser. See that? I use this for small areas. And for, um, I also get either rubber or plastic erasers. Yeah, this one's seen a lot of use. Some more, uh, some more er erasers I got. There's a more complete one. This I bought over at Hobby Lobby. And a very good thing to have for drawing, you've seen me use this in other videos, is this. This is a drafting brush. Again, available at art supply stores and office supply stores. Because when I erase, rather than blowing on the page, getting saliva, or smearing the ink by, you know, with using my hand, I just use this to brush away the eraser residue. All right. And then, oh yes, I wanted to cover one more thing. You can't, I'll bet you can't draw a straight line. Nobody can. Well, I'll introduce you to something that can. This, this is the ruler. This is one of the rulers I use. This is a T-square. I use this for the comic pages I uh, draw, like Sunnyvale Stories. See? Works like that. It's very handy to have, and I suggest investing in one. And now, people, I'm going to give you a little demonstration here of my, uh, of my work. I'm going to I'm going to briefly pencil in a comics a comic strip, a Poison Ivy Gulch comic strip. I'm going to use one of these pages for the demo. Alright. Alright, that's one of the things I like about these Canson comic strip boards and the point and the uh, Blue Line Pro. They already have the uh, the the blue here, so it's pretty easy to make the panels. All right. Now, as you remember in the last video, I was using I made thumbnails, so I'm going to work with these. Just going to lay lay down the uh, just lay down the panels. I tend to. Tend to draw these freehand. Of course, other people 
we'll, we'll use a ruler and when I draw pages like with Sunnyville I'll, I'll use a, um, a straight edge like the T-square I lay down the panels with my 2H then I whip out my uh, workhorse here this mechanical pencil I work very loosely and again that's that's good and you should work loosely here Don't try, don't make anything too dark because keep in mind you'll have to erase the pages much later. All right, now here, as you can see, I'm penciling in Ace here because he's going to be complaining there about Lada's cooking. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit more there. All right. Here. I'm going to also leave in space for the uh, speech balloons. We're going to cover that in a later video. Alright, there we've got Ace. Water there. Start with an egg shaped head. And in her breasts, arms. She'll be holding a spoon here. He's going to be sassing Ace. Okay, see, that's starting to look like something there. It's having her hair, as well as her eyelashes. Again, I'm going to add the uh, her hit, her uh, letter her letters the uh, speech balloons and letters in a future video. Racing here. Yeah, I don't think we need those in there. She's holding a spoon as she's sassing Ace. some motion lines to the block of a uh, chunky soup she's made.
Just like I did here in the thumbnails, I'm going to have Ace giving us, the readers, in a side glance. And there we go. I've got a completed pencil there. Not counting the uh, letters and speech balloons. We're going to draw those in next time. Well, that's it for this video. Make sure you hit the uh, subscribe button to subscribe to my channel. Hit the bell icon to be notified of, uh, of new videos. And check out the links below to my work if you're interested in seeing more of my comics. Until next time, it's me, Max West, your old pal, saying goodbye. Want some tricks on how to letter comics by hand? Then this is a video you need to watch. Hello everybody, it's me again, your old pal Max West. As you know, I draw comics and I do children's picture books. And today I'm going to show you some, uh, some ways of lettering comics. Now, I'm going to talk mainly about lettering comics by hand. Now, I know... Some of you maybe think I I'm, I'm crazy. Lettering by hand? I mean, you're, maybe some of you out there thinking, what, how, do you know what a computer is? Why don't you get with the times? Well, there's nothing wrong with lettering on the computer. I've done it myself. So I just prefer lettering by hand, and to be honest, if you're just starting out, the tools needed for lettering by hand are cheaper. If you want a letter on the computer, well, you'll need different things. You'll need a, either an actual piece of computer hardware, a PC or a Mac, and we're not going to get into the debate on those two platforms. You'll also need a scanner, and you'll need some kind of graphics program. <laughs> now, <coughs> excuse me, if you are interested in lettering on the computer, I can recommend the DC Comics Guide to Coloring and Lettering Comics. This is a very good reference for those of you who want to letter both by hand and digitally. Well, anyway, we're going to talk about hand lettering. <clears throat> now, some of the things you'll need. You'll need one of these. This is an Ames Lettering Guide. Well, this is used by, you know, architects, engineers for mechanical drawing. Many cartoonists and illustrators use this, too. All right. Yeah, you can find this art supply stores, office supply stores. Now, what I do is, on the bottom row, you'll see numbers here. I set it to five. That's the usual size I do. And I'll give you a demonstration of, of how I use that in just a minute. Now, for pencils, here, the mechanical pencil is the clear winner. This is the tool you should use for drawing your letters. Now, this one, I use a 0.5 millimeter pencil lead. This is what I use for, for drawing my letters in pencil. You'll also need a something straight. Now, usually for this, for, for my comic strip, Poison Ivy Gulch, I use a, a good wooden ruler. You can also use a T-square, which I've shown before in some of my previous videos. All right, now I'm going to give you a demonstration. Got my ruler. my pencil and my Ames lettering guide. Let's see if we can get a good view there. All right, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. All right, here. Now, what I do is, after setting my Ames lettering guide, I draw
draw some lines and these essentially are the guidelines that I'm going to be using to um, draw the letters. Again, lettering by hand takes some practice, so don't get discouraged. Right here. Now, using, now that I've got my lines, thanks to my Ames lettering guide, using my, my trusty mechanical pencil, I start drawing the letters in. Right there. Ace is asking, you know, what's this? And Lana is giving him an answer. There we go. And there we go. Lotta, what's this? But Ace, I thought you liked chunky soup. Now it takes some practice with the let with lettering, with hand lettering. So, you know, get you know, try it out. You know, get an Ames lettering guide, a ruler, some mechanical pencils, and practice. I'm also going to touch upon, you know, inking your lettering. Now, as you know, I prefer a uh, dipping pen. I'm going to talk more about inking comics in the next video I do. So, basically, I get my India ink. Good black India ink that's waterproof. Get water, paper towel, and I pull out my, my nib pen. Now the tool I usually use is a Speedball C6 nib. There are all kinds of lettering nibs from Speedball, so you can try them out. People use other tools. Some might use markers. They might use a fine liner marker such as this. This is a Statler pigment 0.7 millimeter, or they might use this, a Pilot Precise V5 rolling ball pen. I've used this too on some of my other work. Some people prefer one of these. This is a, rapid, a technical drawing pen. Specifically, this is a Koei Nor Rapidograph. Again, try different materials and see what works for you. All right. <clears throat> so here, got the... Uh, Got my Speedball C6. I dip it into the India ink like so. Now just like with drawing um, letters in pencil, inking the letters by pen takes practice. You know, it, it'll come in time if you practice. Alright, here we are. Yeah, you constantly have to dip the uh, pen into a jar of ink here. I know that takes some getting used to. But you, you can do it with practice. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Anyone can draw. It is a skill that can be learned. Anyone can make comics. Anyone can illustrate. 
All you need are the tools and the drive to do that. Train your mind, your hands, and there's nothing that you can't accomplish. And there we go. <clears throat> now if you want some more in-depth look, more of an in-depth look at how to use the Ames Lettering Guide, there's other videos on YouTube for doing that. And again, I'm going to recommend that book I did a moment ago, the DC Comics Guide to Coloring and Lettering Comics. This does talk in depth about uh, lettering, both by hand and digitally. It also talks about coloring comics, but that's a whole other book. That's a whole other video. Yeah, it does talk about the Ames Lettering Guide, so if you Track down a copy of this at, at a bookstore or your local library. It's very handy to have. Now that'll be it for this video. Hit the subscribe button. Subscribe to my channel. Hit the bell icon to be notified of when I do new videos. And you want to see more of my work, just check out the links below in the video description. Until later, everyone. It's me, your old pal Max West, saying goodbye. Hello friends, want some inside tricks on how to ink comics? You need to check this video out. Hello, it's me, your old pal Max West. As you know, I draw comics and I do children's picture books. Now, in this video, I want to talk about inking comics. You know, this applies to everything, whether you draw manga, whether you're drawing a 300-page graphic novel, or whether you're drawing a webcomic, and so on and so on. All right. Now, as you know, I like to work traditionally. So I'm going to be talking about traditional tools like ink and brush and pen. All right. Let's get started. You know, when I say inking, a key word is in there, and that's ink. When you draw comics, you'll need a good black ink so it reproduces well. Now this right here, this is India ink I use. Other kinds of inks exist as well. I mean, some people, they like to use um, you know, Japanese or Chinese ink that's used for ink painting. Some might like to use the uh, acrylic ink, which is like acrylic paint. Once it's dry, it's completely impermeable. Me, I use India ink. Now you'll want to make sure that the ink, it's waterproof. You know, check the label. If it says water-based, water-soluble, non-waterproof, stay away from it. Now, when I when I do my inking, I keep uh, I keep black ink like that. I keep it in a small jar like this. It's also handy to have a container of water for rinsing your pen or your brush in between inking, and something to clean it off. I use paper towels. Some like to use cloth rags, or I've heard of people that like to use old socks for that. I'll just use whatever works. Now, um, yes, the very the typical tools you use for inking. Now, my workhorse here are uh, dipping pens, also called nib pens. Basically, you have a plastic or a wooden holder, and you, um, you can pull that out and use different pen nibs. That's a Speedball C6 nib, which I use for lettering. I showed that in a previous video. This is a Speedball 512 nib. This is what I usually use for inking my work. Some give thin lines, some give really thick lines. This is a Speedball A5 nib. This is a C4 nib. Now again, um, it's mainly the western type of pen I'm, I'm more familiar with. You, um, some people might, might like to buy stuff off the internet. I know there's the uh, Brit 
There's um, some of the Japanese type nib pens. I'm not too familiar with those. If you want to try those, you know, go right ahead. Alright, now the next thing I want to talk about, another tool for inking with, brushes. Now here you got some uh, brushes. Make sure you get watercolor brushes. Make sure they're round. Stay away from oil or acrylic brushes. You know, you dip them in water, dip them in the ink, and you ink. I usually use brushes here for masking in large areas of black ink. Of course, some people like to draw lines with brushes. That is very challenging to do. You know, if you're interested in that, try checking out the work of some of the gifted artists out there, like Walt Kelly of Pogo, or Bill Watterson, who drew Calvin and Hobbes. Those are examples of brushwork. And some people just like to draw with markers. There's all kinds of, uh, you know, markers you can use. You got the Uniball pen. This is a uh, pigment liner made by Statler. I occasionally use this. This is a Pilot Precise V5 pen. Some like the uh, Pigma Microns made by the Japanese company Sakura. Oh yes, and there are these. I might have to demonstrate these someday. This right here, you see, these are uh, technical drawing pens. Sort of like with the old fountain pen. There's a reservoir here. You fill it with uh, India ink, and you draw with it. These give uniform lines. You won't get the variety you would with a brush or a dip pen. But these still can be fun to work with. Of course, th these are a pain to clean. All right. All right, now. Gather around, friends. I'm going to give you a demonstration here. I'm going to do some inking here of this uh, comic. I'm going to use various uh, tools here on the page. I'm going to try some, I'm uh, going to do some India ink rendered with a dipping pen. I'm going to use also a little bit of marker on the page, you know, for purposes of my demonstration. All right. First things first here. Let's get some more light. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a panel here, panel borders. I'm going to use a Speedball C4 nib. Let's get the... Uh, Ink ready. All right. Poison, Poison Ivy Gulch, I draw the panel borders freehand. And with the C4 nib point, now when I do uh, Sunnyvale Stories or, or Dominic and Claire or my comics pages, I'll use one of the Rapidograph pens and I'll use a, a straight edge like a T-square to make sure I get as straight of a line as possible. Working with a, uh, with a nib pen takes a lot of practice, and yes, it can be messy, but you can get some really nice lines out of these that you can't get with a, with a marker or a technical drawing pen. All right, there you go. All right, now that we got that done, I'm just um, going to do the panel borders here. I'm going to do the speech balloons. I'm going to do the panel borders. All right. Okay, I'm going to be using my workhorse, the Speedball 513, 512 nib. This is a 512. This is a 513. 
I used to use this with the very early Sunnyville comics I drew. Alright, let's get a nice speech balloon there. When you're drawing speech balloons by, for, for a character, don't put the tail so close to the mouth. I mean, I know they're called balloons, but the characters aren't actually inflating them. Just like with a balloon or bubble gum. Um, All right, and there we go. I mean, just look how vivid that looks. The borders and the speech balloons. Right, I'm going to let this sit and dry for a bit. Now, usually when I ink, I, I rely on the, uh, the, the nib pen. But for this demonstration, I want to demonstrate a couple of other tools, so after I let this dry for a bit, I'm going to pull out a, uh, this is a thick line marker, this is a Statler pigment liner, 1.2 millimeters. It gives a nice thick line, and that's what I did use to uh, draw my uh, picture book with, Hilda and Richie. Um, I'm going to have to talk more about that in a future uh, video, especially considering the fact that very soon I'm going to be doing their next book, Hilda and Richie's Wizard. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, this is, an ex this is my book. That was done by someone else based on my uh, artwork. Yeah, this was... Uh, I drew this with... Um, you know, markers, these Statler pigment liners that you see here. The color, most of that came from uh, professional art markers like these. Again, I'll demonstrate all that in a future video. Oh, if you're interested in buying a copy, I'll include some links in the video description. Digital copies are on Amazon. You can get paperback copies through my store at PayHip. And soon I hope to get these into bookstores as well as um, libraries. But again, that's a whole other video. Uh, all right, I think the ink has dried some. Yeah, I've gotten my, uh, I've smeared ink before. Now you see, this type of uh, pen, this type of fine line marker pen, this gives a very thick line. Again, I like doing that because this is a close-up of Ace. As I've said before, the nib pen is usually my workhorse. But, you know, try out different tools. You know, see what works for you. See what uh, your results are. I mean, some of us, we, we find materials that we like. And we stay hitched to them for our career. <laughs> I originally wasn't keen on using um, the nib pen for drawing up until Matt Madden introduced me to them. I had one colleague, who I'd rather not identify, discourage me from using a dip pen because they were very messy. Yeah, that same friend, he's, uh, he, he says I should stop drawing traditionally and go digital. And I honestly do not want to get into that debate. I prefer traditional tools. All right, yeah, you see those rich, thick lines we get with this Statler pigment liner? <clears throat> Ooh. 
I mean, just look at that. I mean, look how vivid that looks, how rich. I mean, that's why most comics throughout the whole 20th century and even today are drawn with ink. I mean, it reproduces so well. For this panel, I'm just going to go over it with Uniball pen. Be very careful not to smear anything. Hmm. Again, there's no right or wrong tools for making comics. If you train your mind your eyes and your hand, and there's nothing you can accomplish. You can't accomplish. Expression I gave Lotta here. She's just sassing Ace. <laughs> and Ace doesn't like doesn't like it when Lotta speaks to him like that. He has to remind him here who is the adult. Another thing when you practice comics or when you make your own comics, don't worry about what other people think. I mean, don't worry about what internet trolls will think, what your mother will think, what your art teacher will think. Just go ahead and do it. You shouldn't let fear hold you back. I wonder how this uh, block of chunky soup tastes. I don't know. I ain't going to eat it. <laughs> now, once I finish inking a page, I let it sit for at least a good 30 minutes, sometimes longer. Yeah, after I finish inking this uh, strip here, I'm going to stop the video. So I think we've ran for quite some time. And there we go. I'm going to stop the video here. Thank you for tuning in. Again, subscribe to my channel by hitting that subscribe button. Make sure also you hit the bell icon to be notified of new videos. Check out my work in some of the links below. And once, um, if you want to see that picture book of mine, Hilda and Richie is the title, I'll include links to where you can get it. Until next time, friends, it's your old pal Max West 
saying goodbye. Hello everybody. Want some inside tricks on how to color comics? You need to check this video out. Again, it's me, your old pal, Max West. As you know, I draw comics and I do children's picture books. <clears throat> and today I, I touch upon the uh, last part of making comics. Coloring comics. I usually work in black and white myself, as you may have seen in a lot of my work. I mean, coloring comics... That presents a whole new technical challenge. I mean, the whole point of comics is to tell a story. Or in short ones like this, convey a joke. Convey information quickly. What happens is that color, just like with the rest of comics, has to work to convey whatever idea it is you have, be it a short joke, a short story or a longer story. If the color gets in the way of that, that's it. You, you've lost your readers. I'm going to talk uh, some about, <clears throat> about coloring today, also give you a demonstration. Nowadays, when it comes to coloring comics, the main tool used is the computer. Yes, all, most of the comics you'll see out there are digitally colored. As again, you know, I'm old school. I work traditionally. Coloring on the computer is probably something you're going to have to figure out on your own, but there's a lot of resources. You can check out other books, such as, um, again, I want to recommend this one, The DC Comics Guide to Coloring and Lettering Comics. Talks about the principles of color, you know, methods as well as the tools you'll need. You know, you'll obviously need a PC or a Mac. You'll need some kind of graphics program as well as a computer tablet. Again, check that book out. There's also other videos here on YouTube you can look at. It'll talk more about what to do. I'm going to talk about traditional methods. Now, if you want to color the old-fashioned way, you have a lot of options. You can use colored pencil. There's all kinds of uh, colored inks out there. And here's some um, here's some colored India inks. I've used these sometimes, and you've also got acrylic inks, just like with acrylic paint. Once these are dry, they're impermeable. A lot of people, especially manga artists, like to use markers. Now, there's all kinds of markers out there. You've seen me give marker demonstrations in the past. I know a lot of the manga artists prefer Copic markers. There's all kinds. You have uh, water-based markers like these. You have some of the alcohol-based markers like some of these, Prisma Colors, or some of the uh, generic brands that art store chains like Michael's and Hobby Lobby sell. Well, the purpose of this video, I'm going to demonstrate here the um, markers. Well, first things first, I gotta clean up this page we inked last time. You know, and to do that, I'll be using this handy eraser. The ink is completely dry, so we just erase everything, every pencil, all the pencils, like so. So another thing I want to talk about, color in general, I mean, <laughs> color specifically, as I said before, has to work with the rest of the comic as you're trying to convey some kind of idea. 
So this isn't like a coloring book where you can just slap every color down on, on your comic. Otherwise, it'll just turn into a chaotic mess. I mean, we humans, we're creatures of order. When we look at something, be it a painting, a book, a newspaper, a billboard, an internet website, we look for order. If we can't find order, our eyes and our brains will try to create order. <laughs> and you know, if you make a comic that's one big mess on the page, and you don't want to lose a reader like that. All right. Usually I ink my comics with India ink. Today I'm going to use a marker. This is a, uh, let me see if we can get a better view here of the page. Hang on a second here. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Get in a little closer. All right. All right. Yeah, that ought to do. <clears throat> now, to mask in some of the black on the page, I'm using this. This is a Faber Castell Pitt Artist Pen. All right. Let's just. I usually don't work with color in my work. I work in black and white. All right. All right. go. Now that that's in, it's time to start coloring. <clears throat> I have a small collection here of various colored markers. I prefer alcohol markers. Let's see here. Hang on, let me just, uh, just clean this up a little more. Red. We got some red and green here for Lada. Got flesh tones. <clears throat> See here. Picking all the colors here can be quite a challenge. Start laying down the uh, flesh tones here for Ace. I prefer to buy markers loose. If you don't have an art supply store in your area, you know, like a, a chain like Michael's or Hobby Lobby, or an independently owned and operated, you can also look online for, um, for what you need. Yeah, you can find almost anything on the internet. You know, open stock markers, though they have their advantages, as you essentially can uh, just pick out whatever colors you like. There are, of course, sets, and while some of those can get expensive, especially those, pris those uh, Copic markers I mentioned, you know, sometimes it's good that you get a, a, a good set of colors... Yeah, a lot of these are double-ended markers. They have small tips as well as uh, big tips for covering in big areas. Of course, for really big areas, unless you want to get one of those, some of those giant markers, it might be better either digitally coloring in with the computer or, or use something like ink or watercolor. 
Again, my approach, just like with, draw, like with drawing comics in general, is just to keep it simple. Just like with Johnny Hart behind BC and The Wizard of Id, I just want to keep everything simple, simplify my drawing. I mean, it's also kind of like what I've, uh, I've learned with from Mort Gerberg. Yeah, look, he did a very good book on cartooning. I even own a copy of that. You know, just... A cartoon is an instant communication of a funny idea. You know, I only like to put in what is necessary to tell the story. That's why, you know, I have a lot of sparse backgrounds in some of my work. Because I don't want the backgrounds to get too complicated. Not only, I don't want everything just junking up the page, but I don't want distractions from uh, my characters. Alright. Alright, let's just color in the cleavage here on Lada. Right, there we go. <clears throat> See how good that looks? Let's just do our hand here. Just color in ace, and then I'm going to move on to the next part of the drawing. Yeah, that's so one of the re another reason why people like the Copic markers is those are refillable. You know, once a lot of these other markers are empty, they're useless. You just throw them away. And while Copics are expensive, sometimes they're worth it in the long run since you can keep refilling those and replacing the nibs. All right. Yeah, so how does that look? Hey, that's pretty snappy work there, isn't it? All right, let's, uh, now I got the flesh tones in. Just going to do some work there with Ace. He's a nice head. He's a brunette. He has brown hair, kind of like me. In a way, he is my surrogate. Working with color takes some getting used to. Again, look up other tutorials online about coloring comics or artwork in general. It's also worth it you know, just to study up a bit on color theory. Yeah, just like with drawing in general or making comics, Working with color is a skill anyone can learn. It takes practice, you know, is, is learning the proper tools and some research to understand what it, exactly it is you have to do. There we go. All right, let me just work in here. Ace's hair on this one. No, just don't get discouraged. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Anyone can draw. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. Don't, don't be afraid of what other people will say. You only learn by doing. All right. <clears throat> Just going to do the rest of uh, 
Ace's attire there. Going to use uh, this light brown for his buckskin there. And then some light blue for that uh, neckerchief of his. Now besides markers, you know, try some other stuff. Try some colored pencil, try watercolor, try inks. If you really want to go for it, you can even try, you know, learning to color digitally. Of course, you'll need the proper equipment. But again, that's a whole other video. We learn only by doing. Learn all that you can. Practice. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Don't be afraid to start over. All right, now that that's done, I'm just gonna color in Lotta. Just give her some nice red lips there. I usually work with markers when I'm illustrating my uh, my children's picture books. In fact, I'll probably, uh, in a future video, I'm going to give some demonstrations of that. Because I have to work on Hilda and Richie's next book after, uh, after this. It's going to be called Hilda and Richie's Wizard. I'll go more over that, though, in a future video. Just have a handful of Kickstarter rewards to send out. And after that, I can work on selling my picture book. Already working up some deals to get some libraries to carry the book. As well as a couple of uh, sales to bookstores, and maybe even some book signings, dare I say. Uh, but we'll talk about that another time. Right now, my concern isn't Hilda and Richie, but coloring this Poison Ivy Gulch comic strip. All right, let me just do the green here for Hilda's dress. I'm just going to color in the, the spoon, the plate, and, well, the chunky soup there, and then we'll be done. It's one of the things of color theory, complementary colors, colors that oppose each other, red and green. There's a good reason why redheads, like a lot of here, are often wear green. I mean, the colors just go together well. And they provide a good visual contrast. I mean, yeah, look, the green and the red. I mean, your, your attention there is really drawn into Hilt, into Lada there. You know, other complementary colors are purple and yellow and blue and orange. Yeah, with uh, Hilda and Richie, I, I know I said I wouldn't bring them up again, but yeah. Hilda, they're, they're red foxes, I color them orange. Hilda usually wears purple, but I've shown her in light blue dresses. And Richie usually gets a blue shirt. Again, that provides a very good contrast there. All right, there we go. What's left, I'm gonna color in that spoon there, as well as the plate. This is a very dark gray I'm using. Probably have to switch over to a lighter shade of gray for the plate there. <laughs> Got 
let's see what we got. 10%. Gray, we'll try a cool gray, 40%. Another good thing about markers is there's such a wide variety. There's, you know, all kinds of grays, all kinds of reds and blues and greens and yellows and purples and oranges and all kind brown and all kinds of colors you know again you know look what's out there try different combinations of colors and we're just going to color in that chunky soup there <laughs> uh, enjoy your meal ace yeah this is a very old marker this is just about dried out yeah, I think I'm going to have to chuck this one after I finish. <laughs> well, there we go. I'm just going to sign it here. And that, friends, is how you color a comic traditionally by hand. Well, people prefer digital, but I prefer traditional, just like that there. Just get a nice, get a nice shot of that, and there we go. Well, that does it for this video. Hit the subscribe button, subscribe to my channel. Hit that bell icon to be notified of new videos. If you want to check out more of my work, just follow the links below in the video description. Until next time, friends, it's me, your old pal Max West, saying goodbye.